All right, guys, so, so far we've done CNC milling and you've done some milling programming, milling operation, that's by design. Because good news is programming a CNC lathe is much easier, <laughs> to me it is, than programming a mill. Bad news is, is once you shut that door and the coolant kicks on, you can't see anything, so it's a lot easier to crash. So we're gonna kind of take an intro to CNC programming on the lathe and we're gonna start out simple, just doing some basic roughing and finishing, just turning cycles. All right, so we're gonna do this on our Haas TL1. Now the reason we're gonna do this on the TL1 when you start the program, for a couple, it's a couple things is, we got a regular scroll chuck on there. On a, on a turning center, you're gonna have the hydraulic chuck that only gives you about a sixteenth of movement, so your jaws will have to be bored based on what size you're doing. On the TL, you got a regular scroll chuck, just like you got on a regular manual mill, so manual lathe, I mean, you can put it on, put any size in there that it'll open and close to, and we can also reverse jaws. Uh, that particular machine's got seven and a half horsepower, so that's really underpowered compared to uh, a normal turning center. You only have 2200 RPM, but we're not gonna even get close to that, because look what you have in front of you between that chuck and that and, and you. It's just a thin little piece of sheet metal with some plexiglass on it. If you sling a part out, it's not gonna be pretty. So, so we're probably gonna cap most of our programs when you're first getting started, we're gonna, we're gonna cap them around 1200 RPM. And we're gonna make sure nothing's gonna come out. We're gonna be safe about it. Uh, you got a, you got a 2.3 through bore. So what that, what that means on any lathe is, the bore inside the chuck, you know, you can get a piece of up to 2.3 inches inside that chuck, which is always better. Anything bigger than that, you're only gonna be holding on to by the chuck jaws. Now, something to keep in mind on, on any lathe is they have a little trap door in the back when you slide stock into the chuck, into the headstock, you don't exceed that little trap door. You, you don't want a, on any CNC, you don't want six feet sticking out of the headstock of that chuck because the torque on it could bend that into an L and it could, it could literally flip your lathe over. Um, so they got a little warning on there and a little slide and you, you do not go past that. I think the TL, you can get about 20 inches inside of it and, and that helps you a lot for, for grip, but it also helps you when you're parting off, you just slide it out, you part it off, slide it out to the next length, start the program over, you gotta make multiple parts. Uh, I think it's got 16 inches of swing. I'm not sure uh, on that one. Uh, it's 16 to 20, but we're not going to put anything over 16 on our setup. You know, on the particular way we got the tool post, you're going to be at limited at 16. And a uh, cool thing about it is the tool comes in from the left in front, just like you're on a manual lathe. But you know, if you notice all the other CNC lathes, they come in from the backside and your tools are flipped upside down because of that. But on this, you're gonna put the tool in just like a regular lathe, but you don't have to change anything about your program. And the, the computer on the machine is set up so that it is what it is. And, and you don't have to go around and think about why well, I'm, I'm going, coming from this direction. But the only thing it's gonna mess you up on is, is on a lathe, cutter comp is referred to a tool nose compensation. So you're gonna look while well, I'm left of the tool path. No, you're not, you're right of the tool path. So when you're turning, you're gonna be G42 on turning. Yeah, but you're, you're gonna look at it and think you're left, you need to do 41 and your part's gonna come out way too small. Um, that, I say, for the most part, it's, it's, it's a really good machine. It's a good machine to learn on and it holds pretty good tolerance. Uh, does that machine have coolant on it? That machine does have coolant and it's gonna spray all over the place. Uh, because you only have that little door, um, that it's going to make a mess. It's going to get all over you. And I'll tell you something else about them, the little uh, tip of the trade on it. That coolant pump is very strong. It's got a valve on it. If you turn that valve all the way up, it, it'll blow that plastic nozzle straight off of it and just and, and rain coolant down on top of you. So you kind of just crack it open just a little bit when that M8 hits and the coolant goes on. It's going to it's going to come out, but if you, if you got it full pressure, it's, it's it's going to bend up to at least bend the plastic up and point straight up. And I've seen many people get coolant rain down on them over the years with that machine. Now, when you're saying this is the 
previous slide, I tried to catch one, you had it yeah. up there. You referenced 16 inches roughly a swing. Yeah. What was that referring directly to? Swing on a lathe is how big of a, of, of a diameter can you put in it? Gotcha. Because, you know, basically everything comes off the center line. So if my lathe has 16 inches of swing and I try to put a 20 inch piece in it, I'm gonna hit the rails of the lathe. You know, I can't, I can't fit it in there. So all your lathes are rated by swing and distance from head, head to the tailstock. Uh, I believe a TL1 has 30 inches of travel. Uh, it's enough to do a baseball bat, and we, did, we, we made the baseball bat on it, so it's enough to do that. Um, cool thing about this is your X0 is always the center of the part. Uh, on a mill, you know, your, your X0 could be anywhere on that table. On a lathe, it's always the center because that's the way a lathe works is, you know, however big that diameter is doesn't matter because zero is always in the same place. It's on the center line of the tail stock, center line of the head stock, however you want to look at it. So your machine knows where the part is based on the coordinates you give it because the machine knows where X zero is also. So based on the coordinates you put in your program, that's how it knows how big the part is. Z zero is typically on the face of your part. Uh, so that means everything you do past the face is going to be a Z negative. Now that's going to make it a little, little different how you've been doing with meal programming because you're going to have X positives and all Z negatives in your program when, when, when you actually start cutting because everything past the face is going to be a Z negative towards the chuck. Um, a real important one, a couple of the common is a G50. That's spindle speed clamp. You can think about that as pumping the brakes. If, if momentum starts to take over, that G50 is gonna cl clamp it and not let it exceed whatever RPM you set it to. And I'm gonna show you how to set that in your program. Uh, remember what I said with ours, we, you know, we don't wanna go over 1200. So we're gonna set our G50 to 1200. And that, it's gonna be G50 S 1200 on there. And most of the time you're not gonna get over that with the cutting speed we're using on that TL with the low horsepower. But think about when you're facing off, um, you know, your diameter actually goes negative. You know, you go past zero, a little negative into it. So that, that calculation based on that surface footage we gave it can really ramp it up. So that G50 is gonna stop it. Uh, G96 and G97. G96 is constant surface speed on. G97 is constant surface speed off. So it's probably easier to explain to you what G97 is first. You can think about G97 like a manual lathe. It's, you put G97 S 400. It turns that spindle on at 400 with an M3 command. Uh, if you put S 800, it's gonna turn your spindle on at 800. G97 is gonna run the RPM at exactly what you tell it to. G96 is constant, curve, uh, constant surface speed on. That's gonna take your formula that you use for RPM, the 3.82 times your surface footage divided by diameter. This is what gets you a lot better finish on a, on a CNC lathe compared to a manual, is if I put S400 in my G96, every time it cuts, it's gonna recalculate the RPM based on what diameter it is now. So if I started out with two and a half inch stock and I cut it down to 2.4, it's gonna recalculate speed up. It, the smaller it gets, the faster it's gonna go, but you're always running at the perfect surface speed for it. Your RPM is always there. Um, now, now where do you get the, the surface footage for your tools up from? Where's the best place to get that information from? From like with your tools? Yeah, with your inserts and your turning tool holder. Uh, from the uh, manufacturer? From the manufacturer. Whoever you bought that tool from can tell you what that insert is rated at. And they generally just give you a range. And, and that's not gospel. You know, just because, well, prime example, in our, in our ST10, we have a tool in there. The recommended surface footage is 1500. So take 3.82 times 1500 and divide it by inch and a half you're, you're running faster and you want to run faster than the machine can go but so i try not to buy any that's rated that high but yeah yeah we do but you can always compensate it by i'm gonna keep it in proportion so if i'm gonna knock my rpm down i'm gonna knock my feed down by this much too and i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of because of that g96 it's going to keep it in proportion Another thing to know about lays that's not on here is they're in inch per revolution instead of inch per minute. 
Uh, you've been used to programming inch per minute, now you're gonna be an inch per revolution, and that's gonna make a, make a big difference because if on a lathe, if I tell you put your feed rate at 10, I'm talking 10 thousandths, point zero one zero per revolution. If you put in 10 point, um, you're, you're running faster than rapid mode <laughs> on that TL. Um, and, and we've had that happen. Um, I think it was Jody had one in at 10 point and it, it just shoom, took off that first pass. And, you know, it never, it, it acted like it never went out of rapid. And he said, hey, you know, I, I got a G01 right there. But what he, what he had was he had 10, 10, um, inch, 10 inches per revolution and he was moving probably 1,000 RPM. Yeah, he so, had a piece of aluminum on the plug. Yeah. I remember when that happened. Yeah. So uh, G71 is a rough can cycle. That's what you're gonna rough your stock down with. G70 is the finish turn um, and it's, it's backwards, I, and, and I, you know, I like to think that somebody was sitting around when they come up with this and say, hey, let's mess with somebody and let's put the, the finishing number lower than the roughing. But you always rough first and finish. Um, G71 is kind of a long cycle, a lot of parameters in it. We're going to go over that. G70 is short and quick to the point. Now, now here's, here's a trick that you won't see in your books. While you're programming your part and you're having issues with alarm or whatever um, with your G71, you can change that G71 to a G70 and it will force it to run the geometry no matter what you have on there. Now that, this is just for simulation purpose. Don't actually do this. You know, you hit cycle start and run it. But for, for the simulation, if you're getting an alarm and you can't figure out why, more than likely you've got a movement that's went the wrong direction or not what you meant for it to do. If you, if you do G70, it will run it. And it will show you, and, and sometimes you can see what's wrong with your program and what part of it and go back and fix it and find your error. That's in place of 71? Yeah, in place. Like saying, just flip them? Yeah, you just take out the G71, alter it to a G70, and it will show you the geometry then. Because here's what G70 does, it cuts it all at one time and G70 doesn't have the same kind of rules as G71 does. So G70, you know, that's a bad idea to forget to change it back because it's going to cut it all at one time. If you got a four inch piece of material in and your smallest diameter is going down to one inch, well guess what, it's gonna try to take three inches at one time off there. Um, and, and so, that, I. I like to tell people that because it helps them fix their program sometimes, but I, I don't like telling you that because I'm afraid you're going to forget to change it back and, and run. But um, on a mill, you had G91 for incremental. A lathe program does not have G91. If you want incremental on here, you're going to have to go with a U or a W. U is incremental for X, W is incremental for Z. And G0, G1, G2, G3 are still the same. Nothing, nothing about them has changed on the lathe. The only thing you gotta think about, what motion am I moving in? You know, so sometimes it's gonna feel like your gut, oh, that's a G2, no, that's counterclockwise, that's a G3. You gotta think about where you're starting from and which direction you're going back. And it can flip between turning and boring. But you just gotta think about the direction of the arc from where you started. And there was something else I wanted to tell you. Uh, do y'all have any questions so far? All right, does everybody feel pretty good about it? All right, your two most common alarms, you're gonna have type one and type two roughing. I gotta, I gotta work around for that one. Type, type one roughing means everything has to go in the same direction. All, if you're turning, all your X's are getting larger as you go up and all your Z's are going further back. Uh, type two, which, you know, that's a lot of the little cool parts you can make on CNC where your X may get small and get big. You know, you got a little, you got a dip in it or something. You need type two roughing for that. Uh, there is no parameter on the, on the control to set it to type two. If, if your X change direction, you're just going to get an alarm that says uh, type one, type two roughing or, or, or non-monotonous. Um, so the way you can get around that is put a Z move in your first numbered block. So that first number line, you set your, your PQ for the G71, which we'll talk about in a minute. You have to put a Z in that, in that line. It has to have an X and a Z to make it select type two in the first. If all you have is an X, it's type one. Now here's something you can do. 
Say you need type two, but you, for whatever reason, you don't need a Z in that block. You don't need Z to move yet. Put a W zero, because W is Z in this incremental zero. So it's in there, so it gets it in type two, but it doesn't um, move anything. I've done that a lot to fix students' programs over the years because I don't want to change their geometry or their plan. I want to see, yeah, I want them to be able to run their part like they meant for it to run, but I need it to go to type two to be able to run it. So that, that's something you can do is going to go into uh, W0 and non, non monotonous, non, I can't even say the word, so I pulled it up for you. <laughs> Monotonous. Um, Sounds like we'll go with that. Yeah. All right. If you get that alarm, that means that you have, you have left off a, a negative sign on your Z where you meant Z negative and you just put Z. It's saying, hey, Z's changing direction. Or you're in type one and you're, one of your X's went smaller then back up larger from when it was larger. Because it wants you to think about like a step shaft. It wants you to go plane, bigger, plane, bigger, plane. Just, just real simple, smooth cuts through there. That's what it wants you to do. All right, now here's an example of, how, of a program from the Haas book. We're going to shorten this up a little bit, and it, it's going to be a, be a little simpler than that, but what they've got in here is, is good information. It's, you see the way they do, and I, and I wish everybody would do this, actually, is to go in and list your tools at the beginning, because what what it, whatever you put in parentheses gets ignored. So you can put all your tools in. You'll notice they got the tool nose radius on there. Most of your roughing tools is gonna to be a, a, a 31 radius. Most of your finishing tools are gonna to be a 64th. Uh, and you also have tip direction. So when we actually start setting up the machines, I'll have to show you how to store the tip direction. But you're telling it what direction from home is, that, is it approaching to work. So even though you know, you're gonna get confused on the TL because you're, you're coming from this direction, but we gotta program it like it's coming from the backside of it. Um, and those tools, of course, would be upside down because they're coming in from the backside, but on a TL, we're gonna keep them right side up. But if you notice at the, at the very front of it, they take and they hone the machine out, which they're doing it with G28, you know, and that's fine at the beginning. You always wanna start a lathe program from home. You go in with T101. Now what's different here, a lot different than a mill, is I don't have to put a height number you know, with my tool. And, um, I don't have to put an M6 really, it's gonna go get it. So, but that T1 means that's tool one and offset one. So it's gonna get tool one and grab the offset stored for tool one. So T10 would be T1010 or T5 would be T0505, you know, just, you know, whatever you got going. Um, and then they face off, you know, they, they take their G50 set at 2500, they turn the spindle on at 591, and you'll see most everybody does that. They'll go in G97, have the spindle turn on, and just set RPM and run it. I mean, do you have any idea why we would want to do that? I mean, because it's not actually cutting anything yet. It's still at home, but why, why go ahead and, turn the spindle on, running it at whatever number, 591. You have any idea why? It just looks better. Cause you think about like the machine, the, how, how does the machine know how big your stock is by, by the coordinates where you're at? So if you're at home, that X is pushed out as, as far as it can possibly go. So it thinks you have the biggest piece of stock in there possible. So if you turn it on there with the G96, it's going to run really slow until it gets up closer to the work. So it just looks better. And it goes ahead and have your spindle, you know, get warmed up too while it's running. So you'll see most people are gonna go G50 first, then they're gonna put a G97, turn the spindle on. Then they're going to approach to their starting point. And think about this like a landing strip. You see the Z is positive, the X is 2.1. So that, that, that's telling me they're using two inch stock. Cause, you, Cause I don't want to come in already hitting the stock. I'm in rapid. So I got, I got my tool a hundred thousandths in front of the part and a hundred thousandths above the part when I come in on the approach. Um, and, and that's very important. If you got two and a half inch, make it 2.6. You know, if you got one inch, make it 1.1. .1. Always stay a little bit above it when you're coming in on rapid. And then from there, you're going to go in. Yeah, you reference your still G54, wherever you're using. Then we set our speed we want to run. 
So we're going to go in at G96, uh, S325, which is kind of slow. Um, yeah, maybe that's steel or something they're doing in this program, but that's going to take your program. It's going to calculate your RPM, 3.82 times 325 divided by the diameter. At that point, it would be 2.1. But you know, if this was a very large machine and, and they turned it on with no 97, just 96, that, that spindle is just crawling until it gets to that point. Um, and you'll see there that they go into it. They face theirs off, and this is this is a cool way to do it. When you do your Z face measure and tell it where the front of the stock is, you can go back in and subtract five thousandths and have it face to zero, or have it face plus five and add five to it, and it's just going to come in and face it. Um, do you notice what that is? That's going to X negative sixty three for the face and feeding it at ten revolutions. But why, why are they going to negative 63? Because where, where, where's X zero? In the center of it. So you, so you get to the center, but you also have the nose of that tool. So if you notice that tool one had a radius of 31, so they just double that. And you always want to go two times the radius past center. So that's where you, whatever, whatever size radius you have in your tool, two times that past zero in negative, and it gets a clean face on it. And then from there, they get ready to start turning. Uh, I will show you kind of a, an example of what we're going to do. This is the NEOM certification part, and I just took like a little snapshot of it. And I'm not gonna give you the coordinates for the NEOM certification part, but we're gonna do something similar to it and, and work our way to that, and we'll see how close we're getting. But it, on a lathe motion, now, now this is another thing that I throw people off about lathe. The X zero is there, right? So if I need to go here, how far do I, what, what's my X coordinate? It, and um, you can't see the dimension, but let's say, let's say if this is one inch, and I, I'm X zero there, so if I want to go to that point, what's my coordinate? X one point. X one point. But why? I mean, why is it X one point if, I, if that's X zero and the whole thing is one inch? That's what throws people off. A lot of people want to say, okay, that's X zero, then that's 0.5 if the whole thing is one inch. But you program by the diameters. So you don't think about where X zero is you, because really when you're programming, you're only programming half the part. You know, you're not programming the whole thing, but you program the whole diameter in. So. Cutting a chamfer on the end, 45 degrees, or make it really easy. All, that, all I have to do there is figure out where I am here, subtract 60 from it, that's my first X. And, and to cut that angle, I just put my X and Z on the same block together, and it's gonna make it move at the same time. So I, I would put my X point in, then I would put my X and negative Z back. I, I know what my negative Z would be back 60. My X would be that full diameter. It cuts the angle. Then my next block, X is already where it's at. So I just move Z back negative to there. And then the next block, I, I just gotta find out where X and Z are now and move them at the same time. And then here, when you get to a radius, we'll have to do the math, because we got a little bit of straight before we get to the radius. So, but that's what we're gonna work on and, and show you how to do. And hopefully by the end of the night, you'll be able to do it. Is it so we got any questions so far? All right, so I just made this drawing up on the fly. It's probably not proportion right, but it'll give you an idea. Of, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll serve its purpose to come up with a part program to generate that we can write by hand. So we got two and a half inch total stock material. So <clears throat> we'll just call that two and a half inches and, and we'll go from there like, like we're gonna use two and a half inch stock because this is just to get you simulated and, and run your first part on the TL get you used to how everything's gonna work, and then I'll give you an actual print. It's good, you're gonna have to make the tolerance, and we'll, we'll do a generous tolerance on your first one, like maybe plus or minus three thousandths. So the way we're gonna start this out is, you know, you're gonna be at the control, so there's no need to put percent signs in, we're gonna call our tool up. Our roughing tool is tool one, so we're gonna call T101. Now that's gonna be tool one, I'll set one, and then we're gonna go in, we're gonna set our G50, now, what do we want to set our G50 to? For the TL. We're swinging two and a half inches. We got at least three and a half inches sticking out, which is not bad, so it's pretty safe. I think, I think we can do, 
I think we can do 1200 no problem. Um, that's, that's actually really slow, but we're gonna go ahead and start it up there. Uh, at that point, what do we wanna do next? Just like you're on a regular machine, you know, regular manual mill, what do you wanna do next? You wanna turn your spindle on. You know, get it get it going, do I wanna use 97 or 96? 96. No, 97. <laughs> I wanna go with G97, and why is that? Uh, so it'll wrap it to the part? Well, just so it'll spin at a, at a normal rate and go ahead and get it warmed up while it's all the way at home. Because now the way I'm gonna have you do this is you're, you're gonna home the machine out before you start the program at the control. But what we could do if you didn't do that, you know, if you forget to do that a lot, we'll, we'll put a G28 in there but in between that to home both of them out. But you're gonna start this program from the home position on that TL. So there's no need to home out, but because we're starting from home, X is all the way at its extreme limit. So we have to turn it on just to get it running, and that way it's not just barely turning until we get going. So now we're gonna go ahead and bring it in to the start. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into rapid, and I'm gonna put G00, G54. All right, so where should my X go? My, my stock is two and a half inches in diameter. Where should my first X go? One, one inch. No, not one inch. 2.6. I want to be about 100 above it. So X, 2.6. Z, I can go 0.1. And then M8, I can go ahead and turn my coolant on then. And that's going to its first point. Yeah, that, that's coming in from home not actually touching the metal yet. That's I don't want it touching the stock yet. I just want to wrap it up, get close. I don't want to feed real slow all the way from home, particularly on a, on a TL lathe that has a lot of uh, travel in Z. You know, it's gonna take forever to feed up there, but I can wrap it up there fairly quick, but I don't want to actually touch anything while I'm in rapid. And then from that point, I can go ahead and set my, my surface speed that I'm gonna use. Got a question? Yeah, I do. I'm trying to, so why did you start with the widest part of the stock now? I'm... All right, so think about it. Your stock is spinning in the chuck. Your tool's gotta to come in and get close to the stock. So it's moving out, not in. I yeah. thought they moved in. It's, it's moving towards the center okay. of, the, of the chuck. So I don't wanna move past the outside edge of that stock and rapid yeah this this is basically i'm staying 100 in front of it and i'm staying 100 above it so it's kind of like a safety line that's safe line it's a startup line right. it's just getting your tool close to ready to start to cut but not actually cut anything yet gotcha. all right then from there i'm going to go ahead and put in my surface footage because i want it to recalculate my rpm every time it cuts so i'm going to go in with g96 uh, we're using a SCAR tool, a WNMG 332, and it runs pretty good on that machine at a surface footage of 400. So I'm gonna go G96 S400. My M3 is already active. No need to put it again. If you do put it again, it doesn't hurt a thing. I, I could put it there. And now I can skip because we've already faced this off when we did our Z-Face measure. We could put a face off in and we will do that later on. There is a face and can cycle, but the way we're setting up our TL with these tools, we have no probe, you're touching it, and we just go ahead and face it off right then when we touch it. Uh, so there's no need to face off. Now I can go in and put my G71 cycle in. And this is the part that, that you're gonna need to write down and you have to practice and remember, but the more you do it, the better off you're gonna be is G71. I have a P and a Q. Uh, think about those as pick up and quit. So whatever number, I, and I can give it any number here, but whatever number I give it, I gotta be consistent and number that line, that number. Now for the longest time, I always, you know, every time I showed a class, I'd say 101, 102. And it got stuck in people's head because I use 101 and 102 every time that it had to be 101 and 102. It does not have to be 101 and 102. It can be 12, it can be 510, it can be 3, 
before, or, or you could go backwards with it and say 90, 70. Uh, it doesn't matter, whatever you do, just make sure those first two. So, so, so what number do y'all wanna give this one? Any, any number you want, 12? 15. 12 and 15. All right, so that's the first part, and that's that's putting that's, that's going to take the control, put the control in rough turning, and it's going to tell it to read blocks 12 through 15. Now, does that mean we can only have three blocks there? No, it does not mean that. That just means that whatever the first block is needs to be 12, whatever the last block is needs to be 15. And it doesn't matter if we got 100 between there. That, that's, that's all it's going to pick up and read is those. Um, I gotta, if I'm doing roughing, that means I'm gonna finish, so I gotta give it something to finish. So U is for what? And W is for what? U is, U is for X, W is for Z. Z. So I wanna tell it to leave 10 thousandths in X for a finish cut and leave 5 thousandths for a um, shoulder, shoulder and face. I wanna leave those two amount by that. So I got a G71, a PQ, a U, a W. I need two more things in here to make this work. I need a depth of cut and I need a feed rate. I need to tell it how much I want it to cut each time and how fast to feed it at. So depth of cut is going to be D. And I'm going to set my depth of cut at 50 thou. And then my ELF is going to be my feed rate and I'm going to make that, uh, generally on this lathe with a carbide insert, you can feed anywhere between eight to 12, you know, depending on how aggressive you're moving. I'm moving at a surface speed of 400. That's not real aggressive. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm just gonna do a happy medium and I'm gonna look at the chips. So I'm gonna set it at 10. So I'm gonna put my feed rate at 10. And then I'm gonna look at the chips on it if my chips are breaking off, they're not stringy, and everything's looking good, the finish looks good, and it sounds good, that's what I'm gonna stick with. If, if it sounds kind of light and it's stringing, I'm gonna increase that. I may bump it up to 12, or I may bump up my 400 to 425. You, know, um, you can't just say one number is always the right number, because it depends on the material, depends on the tool. That's why the best machinists, operators, programmers, they're gonna have sight and sound. They're gonna be able to listen to it, look at it, and see if it's cutting like it should. I feel pretty confident with that aluminum on that machine, with that tool at 400, you're gonna chip up, the chips are gonna come off, it's gonna have a good finish on it. This finish doesn't matter so much as our G70, but you know we want it to look good. We don't want it rough and building up a bunch of heat while we're cutting and look back. That just makes it harder to get a good finish out of it. And the heat will make your metal do what? Expand. Expand, so when, when it cools, it may draw in half a thousandths or so, and then you, yeah, yeah, that, may, that half a thousandths may make the difference whether your part passes inspection or not. So, so I wanna cut it right even though this is just roughing. And then that's it, yeah, that's a lot, but that's it for the G71. Now think about it. What this is doing for you is you're able to put the finished coordinates in for the program for the tool path. You don't have to sit and, and program every single path of it. Imagine taking 50 to the side at one time, how many lines of code you would have. It, it would go through and feed to there, you know, then back off. Imagine having to program every single pass it makes, you know, X and Z, X and Z, X and Z. That would be a lot of programming. So that's what this is for. You can put the coordinates in, of the finished path in and you're, you're good to go. And G71 is gonna take it down 50 at a time. So with this, we called it 12. So my first thing I have to do here is the N12. N? N12. What does the N do? That's, that's a number block. Um, if you'll notice on software, it, software will number every single line you have if you have it turned on in your, in your post. Um, you know, you notice this is not the 12th line, but that doesn't matter. You know, just whatever we wanted it to be, that's what it is. Now, the only thing would be if I got two sides of this operation, where like I got to turn this side, then I got to flip it around and drill and bore something out, I couldn't use that 12 and 15 again on the same part because it would go back and read these coordinates instead of the second set of coordinates. So do keep that in mind if you got a flip where you're gonna do something to the second side of the part, you've gotta pick a new set of numbers. 
But, and some people would just say, hey, I count by 5, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. This is 35, and they're going to put 35 right there. And there's nothing wrong with that. You, you could do that, or you count by 1. So what's my first coordinate on here? What's my first X? So my first X is actually plotting out the points. I'm right here trying to get to there and then here. So what's my first X set at? 0.950. Because if it's 45, it means it's equal. I'm dropping down 50 from one. So my first X is 0.95. That's my first block. That's all I needed to do from there. And then my second one, where is my X going to move when it, at the end of that angle? What's it going to move to? X1. Where's my Z at? Yep, Z's gonna go back 50 and it's got to be negative. I put them on the same block, it cuts, it goes, anytime, even on the mill, if you put two numbers on the same block, it's gonna get there the fastest way possible. So naturally the fastest way possible is gonna be a, a linear path dangly like that. So it automatically works to your advantage. You know, you don't have to figure out, you don't have to figure a right triangle for this, especially for a 45. You know, because whatever one side is, the other side has to be the same on a triangle. Now, if this was 30 or 60, you'd have to do a little math on it to figure it out if that's all they told you. But for this, you're good to go. All right, so we've moved to here. Now, what, what do we need to do to get to there? Uh, go over Z minus two point nine five. Yeah, just bring Z back. To this point, it's gonna be one inch. And make sure you put your decimal points because it's going to be just like a mill. If you leave off a decimal point, it's going to move it four places over. So that gets me to there. So what do I got to do to get to right here? Where's, what's my X and Z going to be? X is going to be 2.5. Yeah, X will be 2. Two yeah. Yep. And I, I don't think I have this wrote in right, but that's fine. We'll still make an angle if it's not gonna be 45, but uh, this is gonna be X2. And then where is Z? Z is at negative 2.5 to get the right there. And that gets me to there. Now I'm gonna have to erase some of this to uh, have room to do it, but well, I'll tell you what, we'll just, we'll draw a line and you keep yours up, you know, right below it, but I gotta move over a little bit, but that's fine. That's a little section line. So we're gonna pick back up right here. So to get to here, what, what, where is, I don't need to move my X at all, but I need to move my Z to what? And this, I tell you right now, that's wrong. This is going to be three and a half. This is going to be four and a half. So, I, so my Z from end to end, I'm gonna go Z negative 3.5, right? Everybody agree? What? Oh, uh, I was wondering why is that piece longer, like why is that part longer than, than the other one? That's just the way we drew it. Uh, yeah. I was wondering. Let's say, say here, I tried to give you dimensions from this two side, but I gave you from the front all the way. Because remember, this is Z zero. So everything's about where does it get measured from? This is all absolute, so where are we measuring from? Z goes back negative 3.5, then what, what, what do we do to get to, to get to here? You gotta go up. Change X. Let's change X to what? 2.5. X two and a half. And then I'm gonna bring Z back all the way to four and a half inches. So Z negative. 4.5, and then I like to do this, especially when we start using tool nose radius, it's, a, it's, it's gonna be a good line for you to put it in. I got to end these, these uh, coordinates with a, with a Q15. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring it back to where it started at 2.6. So I'm gonna take this line, the very last one, because actually my part is cut now. I just need to bring it up. So I'm gonna take N15, Take X to 2.6, and then I'm ready to home out. And the way I would home this tool out is I would bring X out first with a G00, G53, X0 point, 
M9, turn my coolant off. And then I would do the same thing, G00, G53, Z0. Bring that tool back to home position. And at that point, I would do my tool change to do the finishing cycle. And we'll, we'll have to pick that one up next time. Because we, we'll run this one first and then we'll do finish next time. So like on the, so on the lathe, is the X is going this way? Yeah. Yeah, X is in and out and Z is back and forth. Z is always tailstock to spindle and X is always cross. So, so once you set up your cycle while you're giving it then spin it coordinates? Yeah, that's all you have to do with G71. You got your finished coordinates. That makes life a lot simpler than having to program every tool path. Yeah, it is easier than that. Yeah. And so what could happen here though with this is, which it doesn't have any radius, so it's likelihood is a lot smaller, but say you forgot to <coughs> you know, put a Z negative there or something. So you get an alarm or, or it looks real funny and it won't run right. I can switch that to G70 and just see the actual shape of it. Because G70, that's the difference between G70 and G71 is G70, if that was there, it needs that P and Q and it needs the feed rate and that's it. That's all G70 needs. It would ignore your U, W and your D. So what happens there, that tool comes in and tries to take it all at one time. <laughs> no finish, nothing. And, and that's where you can really do some damage. I've seen people absolutely destroy tools, tool holders, seen chuck jaws broke off chucks, um, chucks ripped off the machine, turrets broke where you can walk up and just spin the turret like Wheel of Fortune. Um, so you can do a lot of damage. So that's what I say, it's easy, it's easier to learn how to program a CNC lathe, but it's, it's more dangerous running it. Cause that mill, I got big giant doors, nice clean glass. I can see what's going on in that mill. That lathe, I can't really see once I shut that door. I gotta trust my setup, trust my program. And, and um, you know, uh, in here, we'll, we'll say, all right, we're gonna have a half inch cushion coming off your chuck jaw. So it's, you're gonna watch your distance to go. And you know, it's gonna stop, move back. You get out in the real world, you may work to 10 thousandths off the chuck jaw. And it's like that because you know, the closer you are to the chuck jaw, the more rigidity you have. So, so your tolerances are going, you know, especially if you're working in the tents. You, know, you can't have, the, the more excess you have hanging out of the chuck, the worse it's gonna be. So that's, um, you know, I say don't, don't let it scare you. It, it, it's just, I'm not gonna lie to you, it's just going to be scary when you watch it coming up that first one. Yeah, you know, that first pass. And once you make it past that first pass with that tool, you know that tool's good. It's not gonna hit the chuck jaws. But then what, yeah, guess what? When you switch to tool two to do the finish, then you gotta watch that first one again because those offsets could be off. But hopefully, you know, you, everybody sets your offsets, you're paying attention, you're not talking to anybody while you're doing it. And you don't not let anybody distract you and your part's gonna come out just like you want it to. And always what we want is no crash. You know, we never want to crash in it.